Hello, my name is Madison Zalapani. I'm the coordinator to access and community programs here at the Whitney. I'm an artist and a disability activist. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Activist is not a word I always identified as. It grew from personal advocacy. Being a disabled woman, I was taught by my society that in order to have access to spaces, opportunities, and experiences, I needed to ask to be accommodated. That I had special needs that needed to be granted externally, separately from my peers. And if my request was denied, usually politely, I was personally responsible to find an alternate way of gaining access or miss out altogether. And while this might attribute to me being an excellent problem solver, it's ultimately a false narrative. It wasn't until I met others who in some way embody similar experiences of limited access and participation that I began to think of access broadly, about who has it, who doesn't, and why. Something I use a lot to talk about in accessibility is something that I've borrowed and adapted from others. It's the notion of barriers, namely social, physical, and financial. Social barriers are probably have the most impact. They are attitudes we create as a society, excuse me, society to create to define groups of people as other. They create stereotypes. They set high or low expectations on groups of people based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, class, or ability. These social barriers manifest themselves in many different ways, from flat-out discrimination to microaggressions. Physical barriers are the physical manifestations of these social biases. Inaccessible architecture and design are oppressive, and not just to the disability community. Yes, if a building has a staircase, it may prohibit access to people who use mobility device. But an austere facade might also be purposely intimidating to people. Social barriers will teach people that they do not belong in certain spaces, and the architecture reinforces this belief. They may look at the space and think that it does not reflect or welcome my class, my income, my culture, or my ability. Buildings with only binary restrooms, women's stalls, men's stalls, <clears throat> might violently message their standard of gender normativity rather than welcoming, welcoming fluidity. The social model of disability states, I am not disabled by my body. I am disabled by my environment. I and other people with disabilities are often excluded from design choices because there is a prevailing notion that there exists a normative, standardized body that are supposed to look and function in a standardized way. This is true for non-disabled people, too. Um, for example, if you're like me and of short stature, uh, and everything is built assuming there's a standard height for people. You're being disabled by your environment. Finally, so, um, financial barriers are systems put in place to make sure people who engender a certain identity do not have the same opportunities regarding financial accessibility. From people who do not have the economic means to do an unpaid internship, to job discrimination, to unequal pay. Financial barriers reinforce social biases and rationalize inequities. So thinking about these barriers together, how they're created and how they're sustained, brings me back to the question of access. Who has it, who doesn't, and why? And when I speak about access, I invite you all to think about it holistically, with room for nuance and intersectional identities. Because what makes something accessible to one group of people benefits everybody. Making sure all subway stations have working elevators does not just ensure people with disabilities have access to safe and affordable public transportation, it benefits all of its users. From the parent with a stroller, to the tourist with a heavy luggage, or those of us who are just tired at the end of the day. Even accommodations that seem specialized benefit everybody. The induction loops that are built into this room enable more people to be present in this conversation, and the interpreter to my left provides choice to how a person might choose to experience that conversation. More voices heard, more per perspectives shared, and more commonalities found. That's what I value as a person, an artist, and a member of this institution. Thank you.